For the last section of chapter 9 in the Ableton Live manual, we'll be talking about how to adjust your warp settings and algorithms to get the best possible stretching quality in your samples. So I will explain what all of this means shortly. So in your sample box here, you've got a whole lot of settings and we will be talking about the settings in this warp column over here, particularly in the bottom half of this. So here you see something that says beats or if it doesn't say beats, it'll say something in this drop down menu. You've got your preserve option over here. And then you've got these other little boxes here, so I'll explain all of that to you. So the reason you actually want to know these algorithms and when to use them is that different kind of musical samples perform better under different mathematical algorithms. So for instance, if you have a drum loop like here, you see the waveform has very different characteristics to if I go to say this one, which is one note that kind of evolves, it's like a synth pad. You see here it's typically a lot more elongated, whereas here it's a lot more up and down. This has a lot more transients, so a transient is like an attack. When there's not really sound, and all of a sudden there's a hit. So drums have a lot of transients, whereas, say, evolving synths or single notes don't really have transients because they start, and often when they start, there's a slow attack time, like here, and then a release. It's not jagged. So Live offers a number of time-stretching modes to accommodate all sorts of audio material, and the warp modes are different varieties of granular resynthesis techniques. So granular resynthesis is the process that your clip undergoes when you warp it. And what this process does, it either compresses your sample or expands your samples. So it achieves this by either jumping over bits of audio in your sample to make it shorter or by repeating certain bits in the audio to make it longer. And this process is called granular resynthesis. So if something's jumping over grains, it's essentially jumping over various samples in here. Don't worry too much about those details. What we are worried about now is to investigate which warp modes work best for different types of signals and how to adjust all these warping controls to get clean stretching. So you don't want to stretch your drum loop and then all of a sudden have all sorts of weird artifacts that you didn't intend to have in your music. A little side note for you experimental artists out there. Sometimes you want to have weird noises in your drum loop and play around with those, by all means, use the quote-unquote wrong algorithms, but for the sake of this tutorial we're going to be talking about which algorithms to use to get the smoothest and best quality audio. So let's start by talking about beats mode. So as the name suggests, beats mode is good for beats, so drum samples or anything with a lot of transients. So it works well for samples where the rhythm is dominant, so if not a drum loop, even like an EDM track or something like that. In this case, the granulation process is optimized to preserve these transients in the audio material and not to kind of gloss over them. It would rather gloss over some of the samples towards the end that don't really give the drums the punch that you typically desire. Alright, so you've got beats here. So once you've chosen your beats algorithm here, you can see below it says preserve and you've got another drop down menu. So like I explained just now, with drum loops you want to preserve the transients, typically because they give the drums the characteristic punch and hit and rhythm in your music. So we're going to choose transients. And what this setting does is it uses the position of the analyzed or user-created transients to determine warping behavior. So if you rather want to preserve things like quarter notes or eighth notes instead of the transients, like for instance this transient is it's not in a random place, but it's not like on one of these grids. So if you'd rather preserve strict measures, then you can also change it to something like quarter notes. Another thing you've got down here is your transient loop mode chooser. And the transient loop mode chooser sets the looping properties for the clip's transients. So for instance, if you want this part of the sample to elongate, the algorithm is going to have to repeat something to kind of keep the sound going. So that's where you're going to have to choose your transient loop mode. So the top one over here, with the arrow against the wall, is loop off, which means that each segment of audio between the transient plays to its end and then stops. So if this were to be carried on, it would just play this and then there'd be silence until the next transient starts. Any remaining time between the end of a segment and the next transient will be silent. Okay, the other option is to loop forward, so that's the two arrows pointing to the right. And when you've got this activated, then each segment of audio between the transients plays to its end. Playback then jumps back to a zero crossing near the middle of the segment and continues looping until the time when the next transient occurs. So let me zoom in and show you what that means. A zero crossing occurs between a peak and a trough. So for instance over there it's basically when your Y value is zero. So if you've got this loop forward enabled it's going to play the transient, go to the end, 
which is going to have a zero crossing, and then it's going to jump to another zero crossing and keep kind of looping like that until the next transient occurs. So until it's time to play the next transient. Then you've also got right at the bottom here an arrow to the right and an arrow to the left. This is your loop back and forth. And what this does is that each segment of audio between the transient will play to its end. But instead of kind of jumping to a zero crossing and keep playing from there, it's going to go back and forth. So the playback will reverse until it reaches a zero crossing near the middle of the segment and then proceed again towards the end of the segment. And this is just going to keep doing that until it's time for the next transient to go. So this particular mode, in conjunction with the preserved transient, let's show you what I mean there, can often result in very good quality drums in slower tempos. And this final box here where it says a zero is your transient envelope slider. And the transient envelope slider applies a volume fade to each segment of audio. If this value is 100, then there is absolutely no fade. But if the value is zero, then each segment here decays very quickly. And if your decay time is too quickly, sometimes you hear a little pop in the audio. So often having a long envelope can help smooth clicks at the end of a segment. But I mean, sometimes you want to have a really quick decay time, like for instance, when you're trying to apply rhythmic gating effects. Okay, so that's beats mode. Let's go to tones mode. So tones mode serves well for stretching material with a more or less clear pitch structure, such as vocals or monophonic instruments and bass lines. So this waveform here isn't necessarily the best example for that because this is clearly not a monophonic instrument. Mono means one, phonic is sound, so there's more than one sound in here. Let's have a listen. I mean, there's, there's more than one note in there. It's but if you have like a simple bass line of a sine wave or something like that and you want to warp it, then tones mode is the way to go. Now, once you've changed the mode, you also see here that you have a different option here. With beats, you had preserve. With tones, you've got your grain size. So the grain size provides rough control over the average grain size used. The actual grain size is determined in a signal dependent manner. So for signals with a clear sense of pitch contours, then a small grain size will work best. So for instance, like that sine bass that you made that has that plays like one note and then changes clearly to another note, then a small grain size will work best. Larger grain sizes will help avoid artifacts that occur when the pitch contour is unclear. So for instance, with this sample, it's kind of like evolves a little bit. Like there, it's kind of... Larger grain sizes will work best when the pitch contour isn't so clear. So for instance, if you've got a single vocal line and the singer is doing some fun things with his or her voice, the downsides to using larger grain sizes is that sometimes you can hear audible repetitions. So for instance, if you're warping your sine bass really long, you might be able to hear the last kind of tail end go over and over again. But it'll help avoid artifacts. So sometimes you have to choose which trade-off is going to be better. Okay, next one, texture mode. So texture mode works well for sound textures with an ambiguous pitch contour. So for instance, like large orchestral music or noise, which doesn't really have its distinct pitch atmospheric pads. So this one could be an example. It also offers rich potential for manipulating all kinds of sounds in a creative way. So if you kind of just want to play around with the sound and you're not kind of sure yet what you want from it, then go ahead and play around with this texture mode. So down here you've got two controls, you've got your grain size and your flux. The grain size control determines the grain size, of course. But unlike in tones mode, this is a setting that live will use unaltered without considering the signal's characteristic. So you can hear a very big difference when I make a drastic contrast to the grain size. You've also got this flux. So fluctuation introduces randomness into the process. So again, we're playing with textures and we're trying to create cool sound design and sometimes you don't want the grain segments to be predictable. So by changing the flux, you're going to be having random distances between the different samples. The larger this flux number, the higher the level of randomness. Okay, yeah, next one, repitch mode. So as the name suggests, this is the mode where you can change the pitch. In re-pitch mode, live doesn't really time stretch or comp 
compress the music. So instead, adjust the playback rate to create the desired amount of stretching. So if live adjusts the playback rate to play twice as fast, then the pitch is going to be an octave higher. This is very similar to the DJ stretching method of using variable speed turntables to sync two records. This is also very similar to what happens to samples in traditional samplers when they transposed. When you're in this repitch mode over here, then if you look on the left of the sample box, you see that the transpose and detune controls have no effect anymore. Down here, they're grayed out. And uh, it doesn't matter what I do, it's not going to change anything. Alright, it's time for complex and pro mode. Guys, these are not available in Ableton Intro and Light, only in, I don't know what the other two are, Sweet and something else, Standard. <laughs> so. If that's you guys, thanks for watching. But for those of you that are interested in this, in the complex modes, I'll quickly go through them. So complex mode combines all of these things into one awesomely cool complex algorithm. It works well for warping entire songs, which usually contains beats and tones and textures. But now it's very, very, very intensive on the CPU, and it uses approximately 10 times the CPU resources required by the other warp modes. So if you are using this complex mode, I suggest that you do the sound design or whatever and then freeze your track so that you can just give your CPU a bit of space. And complex pro mode uses a variation of the algorithm found in complex mode and may actually offer even better results, although it uses even more CPU. So like complex mode, complex pro works especially well with polyphonic textures or whole songs. When you're in complex pro mode, you've got two other options down here. You've got your formants and your envelope. The formants slider adjusts the extent to which the formants of the sample are compensated when transposing. So formants are particularly resonant sounds. So when we're talking, our vowels typically have very strong characteristics like O and A and E. And if you were to look at a spectrograph of all of those sounds, you'd see a lot more harmonics. And these sounds and clusters of strengthened harmonics are called formants. They typically occur every thousand hertz or so. So at 100%, the original formants in a sound or like a vocal track or something will be preserved, and this allows for large changes in transposition while maintaining the same original tonal quality. It is purely just for formants when you're transposing the track. The envelope slider also influences the spectral characteristic of the material, and uh, the default setting of 128 as a really good standard value to use, it's, it works well for most audio. For very high pitched samples, you may have better results with lower envelope values, and for low pitched material, you may have better results with higher values. So feel free to experiment if you're working with extreme ranges, but otherwise it should be good on 128. So with most sliders in Ableton Live, you can hover your mouse into a box, click and drag to change the values, or you can just input a number with your keyboard and hit enter, which is a lot quicker if you're looking for a precise value. So there's actually another option here, which is called Rex Mode, which I don't have here, but I'm going to tell you quickly what it is. Rex Mode differs from other warp modes in several ways. Most notably, it's not available as an option in the Clip View sample box, but it is instead enabled automatically when loading a file in Rex format, so REX format. Rex files associated with the program Recycle by Propellerhead Software contain embedded tempo and timing information and will synchronize to your set's tempo just like any other audio file. Rex files don't have warp markers or parameters or clip envelopes that affect the warping properties or the clip nudge controls. But that's it for all your warp algorithms. Hopefully you've learned that and have fun playing around with them and getting really cool sounds. Thanks for watching.